So, good afternoon to everyone who has joined the webinar so far, and welcome to the 15th webinar in the Economics of COVID-19 series, hosted by the Open Economics Forum and the Department of Economics at SOAS. For those that are unfamiliar with the OEF, it's part of the Rethinking Economics Network, which encourages pluralism in economics. We've had fantastic talks so far. This is the 15th in the series, so lots to check out. And you can find those on the OEF's Facebook page or on SOAS's YouTube channel. And feel free to follow the OEF and SOAS on economics, sorry, and SOAS economics on Twitter, which are listed in the chat box on your right. I think it's that's the correct notion. If you feel inclined to get involved on social media during the discussion, then please feel free to use the hashtag economics of COVID. My name's Sarah Cole, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. I'm a current master's student at SOAS studying economics of environment. Before I introduce our speaker, I'll first spell out the format of today's webinar. We'll have a presentation by our speaker for approximately 25 to 30 minutes, during which time you're invited to ask any questions you have through posting in the chat box to the right of the screen. Myself and other members of the Open Economics Forum will then collate these throughout our speaker's presentation and we'll have a Q&A session for about uh, the remainder, about half an hour, of which uh, our speaker will do his best to answer all of your questions. So without further ado, for today's webinar, we're in conversation with Alfredo Sadfilo about the crises of global neoliberalism, economy, politics and health. Alfredo is a professor of political economy and international development at King's College in London. He's previously taught SOAS and other universities and research institutions around the world. He's also a participating editor of Latin American Perspectives and a member of the advisory board of Historical Materialism. At King's, Alfredo is currently researching the political economy of Brazil, especially the transitions from import substituting industrialization to neoliberalism and from military dictatorship to democracy. If you're interested in following Alfredo on Twitter, you can find him at, at asadfilo, which I will link on the chat box once Alfredo gets going. So without further ado, Alfredo, whenever you're ready, take it away. Thank you so much, Sarah. This is, um, it's great for me to be here. So thank you for chairing the session and thanks to Sarah Stevano for the invitation to, uh, to contribute to your series. It's, it's always a pleasure to um, interact with the SOAS Department of Economics. I mean, this is my department too. I uh, got my PhD there uh, many years ago and was based at SOAS until only a few months ago. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, something that draws on work that I am doing at the moment, but also uh, follows from work uh, that I've done with uh, Ben Fine from um, SOAS Economics and uh, Marco Boffo, who uh, was also in the economics department at SOAS. And it is about the uh, overlapping crises uh, in neoliberalism, the crises of the economy, the crises of uh, politics, uh, and the crises of health uh, now. And my um, hypothesis, my suggestion that I will advance to you is that these are localized crises uh, within uh, neoliberalism, but they are morphing into a generalized crisis of uh, neoliberalism, a crisis of the uh, system uh, of accumulation um, that we are living under. So, but to be able to make this argument, uh, what I have to do is to start from neoliberalism uh, itself. And um, my interpretation is that neoliberalism is not just a matter of the dominant ideas in our society or the dominant policies uh, that we have uh, from uh, government. Neoliberalism, the way I conceptualize it, is the current phase or the current stage or the current mode of existence of global uh, capitalism. It emerged uh, gradually after the end of the post-war boom uh, and it spread worldwide from its main bases in the United Kingdom and the United States, spread throughout the global north through Atlanticism, spread through the global south uh, through the Washington Consensus um, Global South and the, the, the East, the former Soviet bloc. Now, the most important feature of neoliberalism is financialization. Financialization meaning uh, the 
very briefly, the subordination of economic reproduction and social reproduction to the accumulation of what Marx called uh, interest-bearing uh, capital. So the dynamic core of this process of uh, financialization is the transfer of state capacity to allocate resources uh, from the state itself to uh, a globally integrated financial system that is dominated by institutions based in the United States. And this is what allowed uh, finance to control the most important sources of capital and the most important levers of economic policy uh, around the world. And this is what permitted the restoration of US imperialism after the defeats in Vietnam and in Iran uh, and after the dollar crisis in the 1970s. Financialization is also what underpins the transnationalization of production and the transnationalization of finance, which in common parlance we call globalization. Now neoliberalism with financialization at its core, it drove an extraordinary uh, recovery of profitability since the lows of profitability in the turn from the 1970s to the 1980s. And in turn, financialization inevitably, because of what finance does, it fueled this, an immense sphere of uh, pure speculation and with it uh, drove a tendency or finance itself to appropriate a growing share of the total value produced uh, in um, neoliberal stroke financialized um, economies. And this had uh, serious implications for inequality that increased significantly in the neoliberal period. And it had implications for investment and for GDP growth, both of which uh, tend, have, have tended uh, to uh, decline they have tended to decline, even though neoliberalism has been associated with the most extraordinarily favorable conditions for accumulation in recent history, um, which neoliberalism itself uh, created. But even though all those conditions favorable to accumulation are given, you give neoliberalism everything it ever wanted, the rate of accumulation and the rate of economic growth in the core countries has been slowing down decade on decade for about five decades now. And between 2007 and 2020, the West suffered the longest economic calamity and the weakest and the most distributionally regressive recovery on record. And this is what I call the economic paradox of neoliberalism. You deliver the most extraordinarily favorable conditions for accumulation. And what you get is worsening economic performance, greater vulnerability, deeper and more long lasting economic crises. It's a paradox. Now, if you look at neoliberalism uh, in historical terms, neoliberalism has been through three phases that are broadly divided by the mid 1990s and by the great financial uh, crisis that started in 2007. The first phase of neoliberalism is a transition phase. And in each country and region, it has particular features, but it always emerges in opposition to the system of accumulation that existed before. It could have been Keynesian social democracy, or it could have been developmentalist in different ways, it could have been Soviet style socialist, it could have been anything. And what the transition phase involves is forceful intervention by the state to contain labor, to destroy the left, to disable the opposition, to promote the transnational integration of capital and finance. It's a phase when the state introduces the new institutional framework without any consideration for the adverse consequences for society, for employment, for balance of payment, sustainability, and whatever else. And this is a phase that opens uh, historically with uh, the transitions in the Southern Cone in Latin America in the 1970s with the uh, military dictatorships there. And that is followed by Thatcherism and Reaganism, and then followed by structural adjustment programs in the global South 
uh, and then the transitions in the Soviet bloc in China, and it closes historically with the East Asian crisis in the mid 1990s. Now, if you look at these, this phase of transition from a political angle, then transitions to neoliberalism has, have been associated with very different paths, and they can be more authoritarian, Pinochet and Videla, all the way to Thatcher and Reagan, so more or less constitutional method, but always authoritarian, or transitions to neoliberalism can be associated with transitions to political democracy, think Brazil, South Africa, South Korea, Eastern Europe. But what about the path followed by the 1990s, a kind of a typical political form of neoliberalism had been consolidated. And these were neoliberal democracies, historically specific neoliberal democracies. They were heavily circumscribed. And they, in particular, distinguishing features, they included an institutional apparatus that was designed to separate the economic and the political domains, that was designed to lock in neoliberalism, that was designed to insulate economic policy away from interference by the majority in order to secure the hegemony, uh, the hegemony of finance. You then move into a second phase, a mature phase of neoliberalism or a third wayest phase of neoliberalism. That's a phase of uh, intensified uh, financialization of economic and social reproduction. This is a phase uh, that completes the institutionalization of the structures and uh, processes of management of the new modalities of international integration of the economy. It's a phase of consolidation of neoliberal democracy. It's a phase uh, when, the, um, when neoliberalism itself is legitimized through the creation of a neoliberal subjectivity. So first phase about creating neoliberalism on the ground in reality, Second phase is about creating neoliberalism in the mind. And then neoliberalism becomes generally accepted as the only possibility of uh, economic organization. It's also a phase when a typically neoliberal social policies are introduced to contain the deprivations and the adverse social consequences of the uh, transition uh, itself. At that point, the space for the traditional left had declined uh, significantly, both because the economy and society had already changed, but also because most people didn't believe in it uh, anymore. Um, and one of the consequences of the institutionalization uh, of neoliberalism at this moment in time, think Bill Clinton, think Tony Blair, typical figures of this mature phase of uh, neoliberalism, a consequence of this is that in neoliberal democracies, policy space, the policy space nominally available to uh, democratic uh, states, that policy space um, declines uh, significantly and policy making capacity is disabled to a very significant extent. So with this, the space for legitimate opposition declines significantly. There is in reality at this point no alternative to neoliberalism, so there is no policy choice to be made, and so there's no need to debate uh, the economy. What happens then is that the political space that can no longer be open to contestation about the economy, that political space is taken up. It's taken up in sequence by matters of culture, it is taken up by matters of religion, it's taken up by matters of nationalism, and it is eventually taken up by matters of racism. So, it is very important to point out that the transition to neoliberalism, it restructured economies, restructured societies. You read newspapers and magazines from the previous um, period, from the 1970s, uh, you will see a different world. It is a very different world that existed then. And these transitions by restructuring economies and societies, one of the things that they did was to create a very significant array of economic, what I call economic losers from neoliberalism. And if you think of the advanced economies in the West, this is very, very clear. Millions of jobs were eliminated, particularly in the manufacturing sector, but also in certain areas of, of, of services. Whole professions 
uh, vanished or they were exported. Uh, employment opportunities in the public sector declined uh, because the, the state sector itself was retrenched and there were extensive privatizations. Job stability declined across the board. Pay conditions and welfare protections tended to deteriorate uh, as well. And in the meantime, in the meantime, as these restructurings of the economy are taking place, the institutionalization of neoliberal democracy compounds the alienation of the economic losers. So they've lost something, but their concerns are also ignored. Their disappointments, their resentments, their hopes, their fears, their feelings of alienation and anger, they cannot be represented uh, through the political system. What happens is they are captured by the mainstream media and they are dislocated through uh, or to a never ending sequence of ethical conflicts, ethical conflicts between insiders and outsiders, ethical conflicts between good individuals and bad individuals that are framed through a logic of common sense and seen through the lens of undue privilege given by the state to the undeserving poor, to the minorities, to the foreigners, and to foreign countries. And the consequence of this type of political logic is the delegitimation of the political process, the buildup of alienation, and because of the destruction of the left, the creation of spaces that were seized by the far right. So what I call, I've mentioned the economic paradox of neoliberalism. This is now the political paradox of neoliberalism. The political paradox of neoliberalism is that the institutionalization of neoliberal democracy undermined the foundations of democracy itself. The structures of representation became unresponsive, public policy became rigid and indifferent to the majority, and the state signaled very, very clearly that class-based uh, collectivities would not be recognized anymore, and that cash poor individuals were either failures or they were crooks. That's what happened if you are poor. And at the same time, the legitimate, quite legitimate material aspirations uh, of uh, individuals in a neoliberal society, particularly the, the aspirations of the losers, um, were validated routinely by a, a heavily consumption-oriented culture within neoliberalism, but those aspirations would not be satisfied. And the next generation will not do as well as their parents did in material terms. Now, this is a decisive rupture with a generational contract that says that our we sacrifice ourselves, but our children will do better than we did. And this generational contract had helped to validate capitalism since the 18th century. And this contract has been broken under neoliberalism. Even if we ignore, set aside the environmental catastrophe, we can come back to this later on. But even setting that aside, purely in terms of the functionings of neoliberalism, it broke this contract. So in the end, what we have is each person for themselves, except for the perception that minority groups were being given by the state or they were taken, taken by dishonest means, things that did not belong to them. And this was an absolutely combustible uh, social uh, and political situation. Now, the mature phase of neoliberalism comes to a close with the great financial crisis in 2007. And in addition to not dealing with these political uh, and social difficulties, the financial crisis erodes heavily the legitimacy of financialization and the legitimacy of neoliberalism itself. And as we go through the great financial crisis, we move on to the third phase of neoliberalism. That is a phase that is marked by the attempt to manage the consequences of the financial crisis itself in a context of loss of legitimacy of neoliberalism because of the general realization 
of the immensity of the shock that was suffered by the economies, realization of the absolutely astronomical costs of saving finance, and the perception that neoliberalism had concentrated income and wealth, and that it had imposed patterns of employment that were very unpopular and considered to be uh, illegitimate, and at the same time, neoliberalism failed to deliver rapid and stable accumulation. So the core of the economic policies uh, that come uh, into existence after the crisis is a combination of ultra-loose monetary policies symbolized by successive waves of quantitative easing in the largest economies in order to bail out finance uh, and fiscal austerity in order to socialize the losses and to do this by compressing even further the incomes and the living conditions of the poor. Now, this erodes significantly the ideological hegemony of neoliberalism. And the only way to shore up and impose this type of combination of policies would be through the intensification of different forms of repression and the introduction of new forms of exclusion to confound the opposition and to divide the opposition. And this, was, this effort was made, but it turned out to be too much. And what happened was that political control started to escape through the fingers of the traditional neoliberal elites. And it opened up, the circumstances opened spaces for the emergence of anti-systemic forces polarized by spectacular, what I call spectacular authoritarian leaders, almost invariably male, uh, and the open space for a new generation of far-right uh, political uh, movements. So what you have in this period post-crisis is the defeat of traditional forces associated with Blairism, associated with the triangulation and the middle ground, and the rise of supposedly stronger men that cultivate a politics of resentment, that appeal to common sense, that appear to talk honestly and clearly, and that claim to be able to get things done by force of will, and that they often, particularly think of Donald Trump, claim uh, political credentials because of their supposed a business acumen. Now, Trump is not a successful businessman. In fact, he lost billions of dollars from the fortune that his father left to him, but it doesn't matter because he projects the image of being a very strong uh, businessman. And they promise to use their strength of character and their status as outsiders to the political system to then come in and confront, confront the neoliberal state, confront finance, confront globalization, confront the elites, confront the experts, confront entrenched interests, confront corrupt politicians, confront self-interested civil servants, confront captured institutions, confront foreigners, etc., all of whom are attacking our nation and are hurting our people, and they do this to attract the support from the losers, the people who are unhappy with neoliberalism. So very symbolically, 23rd of June, 2016, Brexit wins the referendum in the UK. 9th of November, Donald Trump is elected president of the United States. But these were just elements of a much broader process by which authoritarian governments uh, were installed in a number of countries, and they were installed via elections. Austria, Chile, Italy, Philippines, uh, Poland, UK, United States. They were installed through abuses of the constitution, Brazil, Hungary, India, Russia, Turkey. They were installed through judicial parliamentary coups in Bolivia, Brazil, Honduras, Paraguay. They were installed through military coups, think Egypt and Thailand. And the rise of these authoritarian administrations happens together with the continuing hollowing out of the neoliberal, technocratic, exclusionary democracies that existed in those countries and in a whole range of other countries. So those leaders, they will campaign against particular facets or aspects or consequences of neoliberalism, but once they achieve power, invariably they will implement programs that intensify neoliberalism 
but this time under the veil of nationalism and a more or less disguised uh, racism. So invariably, what's going to happen is that these radically neoliberal programs will hurt their own electoral base, particularly among the losers. And this is a fundamentally unstable political situation that leads to a politics of permanent crises and opens space for the rise of new forms of fascism. So what we have, what I'm suggesting to you is that the political problem that we have at this moment in time is that this is not a transitory blip. What we have uh, is something that will not cancel itself out. We're not going, going back to Blairism and centrism. Um, we're not going back to the traditional political elites. What we have is a systemic political crisis in neoliberalism, and we have a situation where the rise of those authoritarian leaders is a symptom of the decomposition of neoliberal democracy. It is the outcome of the crisis of restructured, neoliberally restructured economies and political systems and institutions of representation. And what we have is evidence of the hijacking of mass discontent by the far right. And what nationalism in this context, what nationalism and racism do is that they offer this mythical entity called the people, they offer a way to respond to actual injuries and problems. Nationalism and racism, they restore a sense of collectivity that was lost everywhere else. It was lost in the production line, it was lost in the community, it was lost in political affairs, it was lost everywhere. And what they do is that they restore the sense of collectivity through the reaffirmation of the worth of those individuals, the worth that neoliberalism denies in every other way. So, what authoritarian neoliberalism does is to respond to this desperate search by the losers for a way to short circuit a political system that is unquestionably blocked. And it is a response uh, to people who have got tired, tired of losing out, losing out to what is presented to them losing out to undeserving others. And the state then promotes the interests of the undeserving others, and so the state is the object of hatred. But at this point, to the right of the losers, to the right of these authoritarian leaders, what we have is even more dangerous movements claiming even greater political coherence because these leaders are not great in political coherence, but movements that claim to represent the losers in much more aggressive ways. And then we reach the paradox of authoritarian neoliberalism. And this paradox is that the economic crisis of neoliberalism and the political crisis of neoliberalism, they promote the personalization of politics and the rise of spectacular leaders, uncontained, unlimited, untethered, by stabilizing intermediary institutions, political parties, trade unions, social movements, the law. They are not contained by any of this. And these are leaders that are committed to neoliberalism and at the same time committed to their own uh, political power. When they are in office, they promote a radicalized version of neoliberalism at the same time as they attack every form of opposition. They promote globalization and financialization. They give even more power, economic and political power, to the neoliberal elites. In doing this, they will harm their own political base. And the consequence is that a disoriented society will become increasingly polarized, wages will tend to decline, taxes will tend to become even more regressive, social protections will be uh, corroded, economies will become more unbalanced, poverty will tend to grow. Mass frustration will intensify in an unfocused way, and those leaders must navigate this dissatisfaction. And the, the way to do this is by creating even more resentments and even more conflicts. They cannot stop, because if they stop, they have to resolve problems and their popularity will decline in the meantime. 
but they cannot resolve problems. They can only perform. Think Donald Trump. Think Boris Johnson. Think Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil. So the consequence is that authoritarian neoliberalism is intrinsically unstable. It's a bicycle. It's intrinsically unstable, and its uh, dynamics will give increasing prominence and space for the far right, and maybe unintentionally even, will give more space to new forms of fascism. Now, this is a degenerating political dynamics, no question about that. But this uh, political dynamics was completely overrun by the COVID-19 pandemic. And the pandemic immediately, what it did was to radicalize everything that happened before. It, uh, the economy wasn't performing well. The pandemic created the deepest and the most, the, the sharpest uh, economic contraction in the history of capitalism. And in doing this, it intensified every single problem that we had. The pandemic hit, and then immediately, of course, as in every crisis, the neoliberal discourse about the, the, the necessity of fiscal austerity. Uh, the, the discourse about the limitations of public policy, those discourses, they disappear. And every single government runs back into some form of fake Keynesianism. In a crisis, everyone is a Keynesian, or even the radically neoliberal. But at the same time, what we could observe very clearly is that as the global economy disintegrated, we had the most uncompromisingly radical, wealthy, neoliberal economies, United States and UK in particular, they were left completely exposed, being unable to produce enough face masks and personal protective equipment for their health personnel, and unable to produce enough ventilators to, heat, to keep their hospitalized population uh, alive. This was not a misfortune. This wasn't a misfortune. These were outcomes designed by policy. Four decades of neoliberalism, they depleted state capacity deliberately by design uh, in the name of the superior efficiency of the market, but in fact to plunder social resources through private enterprise. These governments promoted deindustrialization through the globalization of production and the chase for short-term profitability. They built fragile financial structures deliberately, fragile financial structures that were held together by magical thinking and by state guarantees. And so with the pandemic, what happens almost everywhere is that capital is protected, almost everywhere capital is protected, but the workers in general and the losers in particular, they lost jobs, they lost income, they lost businesses, they lost credit lines. And the ongoing process of disintegration of democracy that was already quite evident and the rise of authoritarianism that was uh, evident, they were followed by the emergence of elements of totalitarianism. Governments incompetently addressing the pandemic, but claiming the right to control movement, claiming the legitimacy to intercept communications, claiming the right to cross-check contacts and health uh, status, claiming the mandate to deploy uh, the military to control uh, civilians. They don't do it very well, particularly in the US and the UK, but we can't, do, uh, we can't continue to count uh, forever on the incompetence of those governments. At some point, they will learn uh, how to do this. Neoliberalism had already cre created flexible labor markets, but labor markets are tending now, right now, to become even more flexible than before as economies reemerge from the crisis, with many reports of workers being rehired substantively to their previous jobs, but in worse contracts, worse conditions uh, than they had uh, before. And given the output losses and the expenses to control the pandemic and that were consequent on the pandemic, many of them have already indicated that they will be shifting to some form of new austerity as soon as possible but they will have to rely also on even stronger political repression to maintain stability in those countries. But I believe that this is untenable. It's untenable because in economic terms, austerity is completely unjustifiable. This is totally not the way to go. And if it is imposed by force, 
austerity will undermine what remains of democracy, and in doing this, it will undermine the legitimacy of whichever government imposes those absurd policies. And austerity will also harm disproportionately those people who had already lost in previous phases of neoliberalism, which is, of course, the mass base of the authoritarian administrations that we have. And I believe that those limitations point to a long period of crisis politics with absolutely unpredictable uh, implications. And suggestions of those tensions and of what happens under those tensions, they have emerged along three lines. One is, if you think of the Sanders campaign in the United States, the Corbyn movement in the UK, and before then, the Syriza uh, process in Greece and the Workers' Party uh, in Brazil. All those were defeated. All those left alternatives were defeated. But what they do is to demonstrate the depth of mass dissatisfaction with neoliberalism, and they demonstrate the spaces for mass mobilization for a progressive alternative. And at the same time, what we have witnessed more recently is the extremely sharp contrast between more successful states addressing the pandemic and less successful states. Experiences in essentially failed states, Brazil, Ecuador, India, except for Kerala state, Italy, Sweden, the UK, the USA, and the successful experiences managing the pandemic in Argentina, in China, in Cuba, in Ethiopia, in Germany, in Ghana, in Greece, in Kerala, in New Zealand, in Senegal, in South Africa, in South Korea, in Taiwan, in, 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 in Vietnam. And what you see by looking at those experiences is a very clear lesson. The importance of integrated public policy, the importance of state capacity, the importance of a strong manufacturing base, and all this comes in contrast with the destruction of the economy that is engineered by uh, neoliberalism, the destruction of state capacities that comes from an uncompromising neoliberal administration in the state. So in this particular sense, I think we can call this one a pandemic with neoliberal characteristics, to mimic the Chinese uh, slogan, to make fun of that. It's a pandemic with neoliberal characteristics because it does not have to do primarily with health issues. Health is very important, but as New Zealand demonstrates today, you can deal with it. And what Vietnam demonstrates, a country with one-tenth of the per capita GDP of the UK, with zero debt, big border with China, one-tenth of the per capita income of the UK, zero debt from COVID. What that shows is that it's not an issue of genetics. It's not an issue of biology of the virus. It's an issue of public policy. What we have then, by contrast, is tens of thousands of deaths in the more neoliberal economies in particular because of policy choice. That's the consequence of policy choice, is that tens of thousands of people are dying right now, and some response has to be given to them. The third uh, consequence from the crisis is that uh, we also saw this. Um, the more neoliberal administrations, not by coincidence, the more neoliberal administration pushed initially and for a long time for highly unpopular strategies of herd immunity to deal with the pandemic at the initial stages. And they only abandoned, think, United States, United Kingdom, Brazil. They only abandoned this uh, herd immunity approach under heavy pressure from below. And they abandoned unwillingly. And because they were unwilling, they didn't implement the other policies correctly. And again, tens of thousands of deaths as a consequence of the unforgivable. This is absolutely unforgivable. If you take all these lessons together, what may happen, and I hope happens, is the energizing of a new generation of left movements for democracy and for the accountability of the state and against neoliberalism. If we look at the explosion going on in the United States right now as we speak, and to some extent in this country too, that is part of this, hopefully.
That's part of this. I'll wrap it, um, wrap up my presentation now. There is a dominant tendency, no doubt, for a prolonged period of economic stagnation and the emergence of new forms of fascism. That's the tendency. There's a counter tendency too, which points to the possibility of resurgence of the left. And if we want to reinforce this counter tendency, if we want to strengthen it, then we need mobilizations. And mobilizations around the defining, the distinguishing concerns of the left, equality, collectivity, economic and political democracy. This is what distinguishes the left from the right, and we can push uh, in that direction. And in the short term, what can be done is the left can highlight, in contrast with the neoliberal discourse, that there is a trade-off between health and the economy, and countries have to choose a position between herd immunity and total lockdown. You have to choose a position for yourself along this, this line. We can say, no, there is no trade-off. There is no dichotomy because the economy cannot function if people are unhealthy and insecure. And what is happening when you conceptualize of a trade-off like this one is you're fetishizing the economy and you're instrumentalizing people to exploit them. So we refuse to make this particular choice. We look after people and that's what the economy is for. You can also stress that there is no dichotomy. Same dichotomy thing. There is no dichotomy between democracy and efficiency. You might remember in the first days of the pandemic, of uh, the mainstream media and governments in the West said, that they could not possibly control the virus as China had done because China is a dictatorship and countries in the West are democracies. That's not true. This is not true. What experiences around the world show is that there is no trade-off between efficiency, controlling the virus, and degrees of democracy. Countries have performed more or less well against the pandemic depending on their public policies, nothing to do with their political regime. What the neoliberals wanted to do was to obfuscate the conversation. And then they wanted to be able to create confusion to avoid taking measures to protect life because their preference has always been for profit at the expense of people. So what the left can do is to articulate and to promote a discourse of securing life and promoting social equality during the pandemic and promoting redistribution after the pandemic, promoting social well-being, promoting the rediscovery of collectivity that has come out very tentatively and erratically through the strains of the pandemic that we are uh, experiencing. And if we do this, then we can also say, let's settle the costs of the pandemic. And let's finance the transition to democratic economies and to sustainable economies through progressive taxation and through the definancialization of the economy. Let's transcend neoliberalism and let's move in a progressive direction. This is difficult to do. And as I mentioned before, this is the counter tendency. This is the most unlikely outcome, but it is possible. And I think it is urgently necessary, and I'll finish on this, it's urgently necessary. And if we do this, then we can turn the crises in neoliberalism into challenges against neoliberalism. We can turn this into a generalized malfunctioning of neoliberalism that can be resolved in a progressive direction. This is um, what I think we, sh we can and we should push for, and we ought to do this now. If we don't, there will be severe consequences for populations right now and for the even greater challenge that will be to address the environmental crisis that is inevitably coming just after this one. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Alfredo. That was really, really interesting. A little bit unsettling as well, I must say, with some of the things you highlighted. We have had questions coming in. Um, I will begin just by asking a few clarification points. Um, so the first one was, you, the last, one of the last things you mentioned was how the left can gain traction and momentum after COVID by 
highlighting that there is no dichotomy between the health of the economy and the health of and I was wondering how you would imagine um, left-leaning political parties to gain support from previous neoliberal supporters or those who support the popularist movements, how to gain their support and how to push that, that narrative. Um, I think this is, these are conversations to be had uh, individually and these are discourses for uh, movements that speak to millions of people at the same time and the example is very clear Argentina versus Brazil president of Brazil is absolutely dead set against any form of uh, lockdown in the country has undermined his own ministers of health has it fights with state governors and with city mayors in order to try and push the opening of the economy, believing that this will be uh, a strategy of minimum damage and that will be good electorally for him. Brazil is an, an absolute pandemonium. Uh, it's currently apparently uh, the third, uh, the country with the third largest number of deaths because of COVID, but the undercounting is absolutely massive. So we just don't know how many tens of thousands have been victimized. Officially close to 40,000, but we just don't know. Cross the border and go to Argentina. President of Argentina said right at the beginning of the crisis, I don't care about the economic cost. The economy is here to protect people and we will go into lockdown and we'll fix the economy. What we can't fix is when people die. That is what you cannot fix. And the, um, Disaster in Argentina has been immeasurably smaller than in Brazil. The contrast is very clear. Well, if you look at New Zealand, implemented very sensible policies early on, and the Prime Minister of New Zealand has stressed this very, very uh, strongly. There was never consideration of a strategy of herd immunity in New Zealand. So. Uh, and they would definitely go for the strategy that they went and they were massively successful. So the discourse that I think we can, in a very defensible way, in a very reasonable way, and with plenty of evidence we can put on the table is that it works. Addressing health works and this respond to the imperative, the intuitive, instinctive imperative that every uh, human being, unless you're Richard Branson or whatever, uh, every human being, uh, feels, and I mentioned Richard Brownson because the first thing he did was to come to the British government and ask for subsidies, even though he doesn't pay tax in this country. Um, every human being feels the need for protection. That is the basic function of the state. If you cannot protect life, in my view, you forfeit the right to be a government. And in the UK, the US, Brazil, and other countries, they forfeited that right through perversity and incompetence at the same time. So if we put this and if we show the examples of success, I think we are in a very solid uh, position to convince people that there are, there are alternatives. Despite all the obfuscation, there are alternatives. Okay, thank you. I've got a question here from Aidan de Bronner. How can civil society lead the change you allude to without participating directly in politics? Well, they should participate in politics. Of course, they have to participate in politics. They have to push their way in. So when you uh, go to Bristol and you take a statue and you throw it into, into the river, you're participating in politics. That is not the politics of, of parliament. It's a politics that overruns parliamentary politics, creates facts on the ground. If you do what is happening right now in the United States and you claim your rights and you say, I'm not going to be treated that way anymore, that is a political statement that you're making. And that is truly transformative. And it's very, very important to act through parliament and through the institutional means of the state. Very, very important. And that consolidates gains and that changes policies and it moves the public administration and that is the kind of politics that builds more hospitals and builds more houses. But at the same time, if you shake the system from outside, 
you change the quality of the game. Mm-hmm. It doesn't happen very often, but we may be at a moment in time when this is uh, happening now. And I think the younger generation has realized that they have to say something because it's a generation that has been uh, the um, that has suffered immensely through the consequences of the great financial crisis. It's a generation that will be stunted by the consequences of this pandemic in terms of their careers, prospects, uh, earning potential, etc. It's a generation that in the UK and in the US in particular has uh, an extremely heavy uh, load of student debt on their backs for no particularly good uh, possibilities of employment. The generation that has to say, what, what, what's going on here? We will not accept this kind of deal, this kind of generational deal, where we are laden with the burden of austerity and have very limited uh, prospects for material satisfaction that neoliberalism itself says that is the measure, that is the be all and end all of human life. No, first it's not, but second, we want the space to be happy, to construct happy lives. And happy lives, they need, first of all, they need respect. And that is part of what's going on, I think, in the United States, but also in this country. And we want the state to be constructive in that sense and not to be a burden and an obstacle. So I'm optimistic. I'm pessimistic about the rise of fascism, etc. I'm optimistic that a new set of demands for rights, a new set of demands for states that function in different ways, will be embodied by the younger generation and that they will be very loud and clear about their demands. That's what I'm hoping for. Thank you again. We have got a lot of questions now, so I'll try and get through these quickly. Question from Edward. He thanks you, first of all, for your analysis of the mechanisms through which neoliberalism hinders the full realisation of democracy. And he asks, do you think that following the pandemic, the world will tend to increasingly look at China as an alternative economic and political model. My hunch, on the basis of nothing in particular, and I'm not a specialist on this, uh, is that the pandemic will be a marker on the uh, long-term shift of hegemony from West to East. China dealt with the pandemic, and not just China, but also South Korea and Taiwan and Hong Kong and Singapore and Vietnam, all in different ways, but very efficiently. Their economies will also, not just the pandemic, but their economies will also recover, very likely, will recover relatively rapidly. And the West has fumbled. The West was already mired in economic stagnation and they will not be able to shake this off, in my view, in the coming months and years. So a discrepancy of political capacity and policy capacity and a discrepancy in terms of economic performance will be very visible in the months and years to come. This, at the moment, is pointing toward the response from the West, is pointing towards increasing aggression. The posturing of the United States against China, the shift in the position of the British government against China uh, as well, treating China as a strategic uh, enemy uh, instead of treating China constructively as a country to engage uh, with. It's the tradition of the West to look at everywhere else uh, as rivals and to try and destroy them. It is what it is. It is a shame. In my understanding, um, China will be increasingly, tends tends to be increasingly successful. It has huge resources and a a functioning state. The West has more limited resources and dysfunctional states. So I think that points to this shift in hegemony. We'll wait and see in the next 10, 20, 30 years, we'll be able to answer this question. But at the moment, it's just speculation. Thank you. We have another question from Natasha Kunesh. She asks, she thanks you first for your insights and asks, what are your thoughts on the just transition, building economic and political power to shift from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy? I think this is absolutely fundamental. We are at the cusp. No, 
Uh, let, let, me, let me be more realistic. We are in the, a process of runaway climate change. It has already started and it is runaway. It's out of control. If we do not use the lessons from this pandemic in terms of state capacity, in terms of organization, purposeful intervention, etc. It's so lessons that come from the East. They do not come from the West. If we fail to draw those lessons and use them immediately and aggressively to address the climate problem, we will go extinct. But in the process of going extinct, there will be untold suffering on billions of people as the human species degrades itself and debases the earth, moving rapidly. I thought we had more time. Actually, we don't. Moving rapidly to a situation of mass extinction, including ourselves. So the, the stakes could not possibly be higher, and we must absolutely shift the energy base of the earth. We must absolutely invest in renewable uh, resources. We absolutely have to shift away from the model of accumulation and growth that we have had so far. If we don't, we are truly, truly, truly done for. So hope is there, but we do need to act and we need to act right now. Thank you. We've got a two part question. It's quite long coming in from Antonella Levi Sforza. So she thanks you first of all and asks one, do you think that nationalization will increase the degree of global financialization? I think we'll, we'll go from there because the next question is quite long. <laughs> okay, uh, it may or may not. It depends on how nationalization uh, is imposed, how it is financed and how it operates. These two things, nationalization and financialization, are in principle unrelated. So you can have nationalizations as we had in 2007, nationalization of the banks that does build financialization and then you give the banks back to the private sector uh, and the, what the state gets is the losses and then subsidizes uh, what socialism for the rich, capitalism for everyone else. That is unethical, that would be, uh, that would be wrong, that would be detestable. But you could have nationalizations in a progressive direction where the state takes over uh, particular areas of the economy and together with uh, mechanisms of accountability and efficiency. You have to have managerial efficiency and you have to have accountability to the wider population. So if that can be done, that would be amazing. I think I would be in favor of that in takeover finance, for example, but take over other strategic areas of the economy, definitely the energy sector and then build something more sustainable and more responsive to people's desires, wishes, preferences, and imperatives. First of all, the imperative to live, the imperative to live. That's the one we'd have to deal with, first mm -hmm. of all. So there is hope. Okay, and the second part of the question was regarding relocation in countries such as Brazil, Eastern Europe, and even the USA, in different areas such as grain production in the South and industrialization in the West and North, is it going to be a reality? In what grade? Do you think, for example, Cargill and other groups working in agribusiness will migrate to other businesses and leave branches they have around the world? If yes, could you please speak to us about the implications and relationships with the financial world? That's a difficult one. I don't care what Cargill does. I wish the company was destroyed. That would be the most constructive outcome for a company that specializes in perverse models of growth as uh, that one. It is very difficult to think of an integrating industrial policy for the world. At the moment, we're stuck with uh, states and state policy uh, or state level policy. And what countries must realize, again, given the lessons of the pandemic, is that they have to have industrial policy. They have to aim for a minimum level of integrated manufacturing capacity because when the crisis comes, you will lose your friends. It will be each country for themselves. So there has to be a degree of concern with uh, manufacturing capacity and the ability of countries to provide for their own populations, you know, again, in order to secure life. Um, if we can do better than this, uh, I hope we can do better than this by definancializing and then by integrating in constructive ways 
um, economic, the economic base of different countries. The EU did not do well in the pandemic, absolutely did not do well, but it could in principle have done better. I don't see any um, reason in principle why it could not have done uh, acted uh, differently. So transnational integration can be a good thing and it can increase capacity and it can increase solidarity. If countries should continue with um, concentrating on agricultural production, production of commodities for export, no. In my view, they should not. They should aim to have diversified economies. They should aim to have the capacity, again, to secure life and employment and incomes for their population. In the world in which we live, you have to think of your population with particular concern and seek integration with other countries to the extent that this is that this is possible. And the interest of cargo, I really don't care. Uh, I really don't care about that. Thank you very much. We've got just about five minutes left, so I'll ask you the last two questions. We've got a question from Malik Imtaz Ahmad, and he asks, COVID-19 has had a huge impact on the financial conditions of private as well as public institutions. So when is the right timing? Is now the wrong time? Definancialization of state-owned enterprises to avoid massive losses in state debt. The time is now. But the one thing that we've noticed is that uh, increasingly central banks are getting more and more involved uh, with financial institutions and with uh, corporations. And if in the previous crisis, in the Great Financial Crisis, central banks started buying um, bundles of paper from the banks, bundles of private paper from the banks in order to support the, the banks by issuing cash. This time around, the, bank, the central banks are buying paper directly from private corporations. They are intervening directly into individual circuits of accumulation and realizing surplus value that uh, has been uh, produced elsewhere in the economy and channeling it to particular, uh, to particular capitals. It's an unprecedented degree of intervention in the realization of capital uh, and in the accumulation of capital. The signal is there. there is, this is a signal for the socialization of finance. Finance is already performing a social role. So just go there and take it over and then eliminate that massive sphere of speculation. All that paper being traded between financial institutions has no meaning. It is just a, a game to generate uh, income and revenue for particular uh, traders on the market. This is completely parasitical on the real economic uh, uh, activity. So eliminate all that. And you can eliminate all that in one fell swoop by just nationalizing the key banking uh, financial institutions and closing down the rest. And this will be a massive shock for heavily financialized economies like this one in the UK. The city employs or finance employs about a million people, perhaps even more. It's a, it's a massive shock, but it's the cost that you have to pay for having specialized wrongly uh, in the past. But this will lead to greater economic stability. So a, a set of targeted interventions can contribute to greater economic stability in the future and can ameliorate problems of volatility uh, and costs when you have to rescue finance on a regular basis. If every decade you have to rescue the financial system, well, why would you want to do that? Finance does not contribute to anything, and it costs a lot of money, money to maintain. Let's just cut the losses. Thank you very much. I think we are just about out of time. So thank you, everyone, for all of your questions. And thank you so much to Alfredo for your wonderful presentation and for so succinctly and in-depth answering the questions. If I've not been able to read out any of your questions, feel free to tweet them at Alfredo. I've left his Twitter handle at the top of the chat. So if that's all right with you, Alfredo. <laughs> it looks like your afternoon might be taken up with answering those. Um, Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> if you've got any concluding remarks, actually, you'd like, you'd like now, you've got about 30 seconds. No, no, this is great. It's fantastic to be uh, in the SOAS Economics Department. You're lovely people, and I, I think this department is amazing. So thank you. Thank you so much. I'd just like to remind everyone who is still on the webinar that the next 
uh, webinar in the series will be on the subject of Requiem for the Africa Rising Narrative with Ndongo Sambasala taking place on Wednesday the 10th of June at three o'clock. So stay well, stay safe during lockdown, look after yourselves and Alfredo, thank you once again for a fantastic webinar. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. Goodbye.